Thank you, Keaton. You're so good. I always think that someday we're going to be listening to Keaton at Opryland or something like that, and uh, um, the, old, the Grand Old Opry house. I thought that was funny. I don't know about you. <laughs> you South by Southwest, okay. Whatever that means. <laughs> If you have your Bibles, turn with me to a book that you probably don't study very often. You're going to get an opportunity to study it today. It's where we're going to call out some of the lies that are told to you and that you can't trust and you shouldn't base in, in your life. And it's the book of Ecclesiastes. It was the favorite book of Abraham Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln. Uh, in my view, is one of the, maybe the greatest president that the United States ever had. He wrestled with discouragement through his whole life. He um, they called it melancholy in those days. And he had a good reason for to be discouraged. Not only had he lost every election that he ran for until he ran for president, uh, when he became president, they knew that he was an abolitionist, that he was against slavery. And so the South seceded when he became president, and this horrible war started. Not only that, one of his best friends was his son, Willie, who died at a very young age, and he never really recovered from that grief. His wife was so depressed during that melancholy that she had to go through that she had an emotional breakdown and had to be institutionalized. Um, Abraham Lincoln, many of his best friends were his worst enemies and would, would talk behind his bath, back publicly. It was, if you read Lincoln on leadership, you know that he, sometimes he'd say, you know, I think they're right. And uh, he handled it quite differently. And then he struggled with self-esteem during his life. He struggled to have a positive view of his life. So you can associate with that too. He was known for being ugly. I think he's handsome, but he's known for being ugly. And um, in fact, he used to make the joke on the campaign trail that he used to be very good looking, looking when he was a baby. And then some thieves came and stole him and replaced him with another baby, and he's been ugly ever since. Uh, so he would joke about the great um, issues he had and the discouragements he had. You know what his favorite book was in all the Bible? The book of Ecclesiastes. He quoted from it more than any other book. And... Um, in his speeches, and he said, he, of course, he thought the Bible is great literature. He said Ecclesiastes is the greatest book in all of literature, and it's a book of discouraged writings. In fact, when you read it, you're going to wonder why the Bible, why God allowed it to be in the Bible, this great book of literature. And so I want to study it with you because we're st starting into a new, new series of messages on encouragement that works. And we're studying wisdom literature. So already when I announced that series, Pastor Ray is going to be preaching the week that he's here for the auction. And he said, I got dibs on Proverbs, uh, uh, I think it was 13.7. He said, I've been living through this a whole week. I've been wanting to preach a message at Washington Cathedral. It's a very encouraging message. And, and Pastor Linda texted me yesterday and said, what verses are open? Um, what book of wisdom literature are, are open? And I said, well, I'm, I'm not by my desk where I'm keeping notes, but, and she made a claim to a verse, and, and Pastor Becca asked me, she said, you know, I'd love to hear you preach a sermon on the book of Ecclesiastes. People don't preach on it very much, and, and it's a great book of repentance, and uh, she was inspired in a message that she heard at Princeton uh, about the book of Ecclesiastes, and so I'm going to study that with you, and I'm going to share just at the beginning of some encouraging words that God has in the middle of this discouraging verse and this discouraging book, it's kind of the Bible for pessimists, uh, the, or the gospel for pessimists, and um, it gets down to the depth of how to encourage people. Everyone wrestles with discouragement. Everyone has would have's and could have's and should have's. I'm not going to make, make you raise your hand if you haven't had, if you've had those, but if you haven't had uh, times of discouragement, then just stand up on your chair. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> We've all had those moments. Uh, even Jesus Christ was discouraged before he went to the cross. Um, Adam was discouraged after the fall. Cain was discouraged after he made a terrible mistake and murdered his brother. And God actually said, I'm going to put a mark on you because I don't give up on people. And I'm going to be watching after you even though you're a murderer. Uh, God has a love for you that's beyond anything that you can possibly imagine. Saul, King Saul in the Bible, was uh, what we know today as probably bipolar. Um, he went from manic states where he just was so high and so excited to depths of depression whenever he would throw a javelin at the person who was playing the harp, who happened to be David. 
He'd go from the highs to the depths. And then we know that David also had some of those kinds of issues because when he was excited, he was dancing naked in front of the altar, something that we don't encourage at church, right? Uh, he got out of hand sometimes. And at the depths, you, you would read passages like this in the Psalms of David where he'd say, my whole family hates me. Everyone in the world's against me. I feel like I'm entering into the pit of Sheol. And um, I used to, when I was a young pastor, I'd go to the Bible and I'd try to read something to, for encouragement to people that were in really struggling times. And I remember picking the wrong verse and, and learning I needed to pick them ahead of time because I'd go into this person and there's the monitor going beep, beep, beep. And I would say, let me read you something encouraging. My whole family hates me. <laughs> um, everyone in the world hates me. I'm surrounded by enemies. I wish I was just in the depths of, of Sheol. And they would go beep, 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 beep. I'm like, okay, I got the wrong verse here. The Bible allows discouraging things, this is a perplexing problem, to be written. And why is it even in the Bible? Well, we're going to answer that question today because it's very, very important. If you want to encourage people, you want to be encouraged. This is what it says in the New Living Bible at the beginning of the book of Ecclesiastes. These are the words of the teacher. Now, some of you, if you have the old King James Version of the Bible, it'll say, the preacher, right at the, the title. And it's because of the translation of this Hebrew word, kolat. It's neither preacher nor teacher is a good translation. It means someone who's assembled all the people they care about, and they want to pour wisdom into their lives. So sometimes I was telling last week a story about how, how Oscar encouraged me and uh, came up and I said, I love you, Oscar. And he said, I know, and then took off running and just that saying, I know, encouraged me. Or maybe it's a grandparent that wants to encourage grandchildren and they're calling everyone together. Well, Solomon, at this point in his life, long into his life, um, and about half of biblical theologians believe Solomon writ, wrote this. Other half believe that it was maybe a collection of some of his writings and other writings later. But it's written from the context or like a play that Solomon at least wrote it. And at, when Solomon took over as the last king of Israel, David had been this incredible giant slayer, this incredible champion that had conquered from Israel from the Gulf of Aqaba, which is no longer an Israeli territory, to Syria, up by Mount Hermon in Syria, to the Mediterranean Sea, to the, where the Suez Canal is today. It was this huge, extravagant thing. When I was an archaeological student in Israel, we found the, um, the stables of Solomon and saw, wow, this guy had a lot of horses. So we know that at one time, there was this very wealthy king of Israel who had the trade routes. Well, when Solomon was young and he became king, he prayed and asked for one thing. Do you know what that was? Wisdom. God said, I'll give you anything. What do you want? He said, I want wisdom. So this is a part of a genre of literature that's not only in the scriptures, it's, it's all around, but it's called wisdom literature, and it teaches us how to be wiser. And Solomon, through his life, he did something that Christians used to call, he backslid, he fell, he tripped up. And he made a real bit, very big mistake that I hope none of you make. I hope you learn this lesson. He got married to a thousand women. That's a very big mistake. Chuck, don't make that mistake, okay? <laughs> that will be problems. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And in that, it tells us in the first and second, or second Kings, it tells us that it, his faith fell. The daughter of Pharaoh, for instance, she believed in idols. And some of the idols that they would believe in is Baal, where they would actually kill their children. Um, and the worship of God. I mean, it was horrible things that they would do in the name of who they believed in God. And these thousand wives that um, a concubine is basically a mistress, so he had 700 official wives and 300 mistresses, and, and they swayed his heart. And he lost his love for God, and he became very distant from God and very discouraged about God. And so he writes this letter of wisdom later on in his life, or at least that's the context of the letter, to say, here's how to get discouraged if your whole life is full of would-haves, could-haves, and should-haves. You see, every one of you, you're, you're not alone. You have this inner dialogue going on inside of you, right? Like, I should, I shouldn't. 
Um, what should I do here? Like, you know, the cartoons picture it this way. So when I came in here this morning, I had on my uh, right shoulder a little devil in the cartoons. And the little devil said during the donut break, Tim, go get a donut. And then on the other side is a little angel. And the angel said, you heard the man, go get a donut. No, I'm just... <laughs> I didn't have a donut. I didn't have a donut. But we have that kind of struggle going on in our lives, right? Where you can just be buried by your regrets in your life and you can be discouraged. And there's nothing wrong. This is one of the reasons that there's the wisdom literature is so important. There's nothing wrong with being discouraged. Jesus was discouraged. If you care, you're going to be discouraged. Life's not going to go the way that you want it to. And you, you might be depressed that you don't get into the college that you want or, or something happens in your life that, that there's no way around it. The loss of a loved one or your, your parents go through a divorce or you have a d- divorce or you have a breakdown in a relationship and you are discouraged. And the Bible doesn't say, no, no, you should never be discouraged. No, it shows us how to grow through discouragement. And one of the things I want you to know, there's nothing wrong with going to a good Christian psychologist or a psychiatrist, and I can recommend them to you to help you because we go through those times. And in this passage, it shows someone who's deeply discouraged. And this is what it says. It doesn't sound like it should be in the Bible. Everything is meaningless. Does that sound like that should be in the Bible? Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, or the Colette. Utterly meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work? In the the original language, it keeps using the phrase, under the sun. In other words, everything's meaningless under the sun. And so they have this concept of the universe, and what it's saying here subtly, and all the Bible scholars agree, is if you take God out of the picture, out beyond the universe that you can see, and they had a, 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 a not a very sophisticated understanding of the universe, but beyond the universe, if you take everything just in what you see, and you take God out of the p- picture, it's just meaningless. And then it goes on and it has this, these these discouraged writings, that's actually used, that phrase is used 39 times in the book of Ecclesiastes and never used the rest of the Bible. It says, everything is meaningless, utterly meaningless. What do people get out of all their hard work? Generations come and go, but nothing really changes. The sun rises and sets and hurries around to rise again. The wind blows out of the north, here and there, twisting back and forth, getting nowhere. The rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Here's a person that's discouraged just watching rivers. My whole life that river's been pouring in the sea. You think the sea would be full and then we wouldn't have to have rain anymore and there wouldn't have to be rivers anymore. It's just meaningless to him. And he said, goes on to say, then the water returns again to the rivers and flows into the sea. Everything is so weary and tiresome No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are never content. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Those are discouraged words. And human beings get discouraged. The problem is they don't ever get to share that discouragement. Because especially in American society where we're can-do people, we have Yankee ingenuity, we want to fix it quickly. So if you're down and you don't know why you're down, someone will say, well, just be up. And the idea is that if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything, every problem looks like a nail, right? Well, sometimes it's not a nail. And so we hear Jesus, like when he meets the woman who's been married five times and she's discouraged and she's, even from the Samaritan people, um, no one wants to talk to her. Jesus has a conversation with her and he hears what the problem is. So in this wisdom literature, when it's talking about the depths of discouragement, it's saying it's important to be heard. God wants to hear what your deepest discouragements are. Now that's a whole new approach. If we were to go to Kenya and to the Mathari, where there's 500,000 people, second largest slum in the world, and the people are thirsting to death, very complex problem. I, the assistance of, of the Pope was actually helping me work on this, and we tried to arrange a system for an aqueduct 
but the government toppled. It's a very complex problem. We're lucky to be able to have the crew that can dig the well. And they come up to us, and they're actually the doctors, like Dr. Dunn said, the biggest problem is a neurological. They're all thirsting to death. And they come up to you, and they're like, I'm so discouraged. And we're like, well, be encouraged. Instead of, let's find some water for you. Let's find some safety for you. And so one of the best things that you can do to encourage people is to listen to them. Now, that is very hard, especially for us men. We want to come to a solution immediately. And um, the women in our lives, the children in our lives, they want to tell us a problem. We're going to be like, well, here's a list. Get the right answer. And we just don't even want to listen, right? It's a retraining of our lives to be more like Christ, to be more like God, to listen to people's problems. In our family, we have this rule that we started when when Jackie and I first married, we first had kids, and, and our kids were very demanding, and that is that Jackie, as the mother, had the right for a quiet time. And she takes a long quiet time, like an hour, where no one can talk to her. If you want breakfast, it doesn't matter. She's having her quiet time. If you want to know where your socks are, it doesn't matter. She's having her quiet time. And it was a great thing. I, th- I felt like a very liberated husband to say, Mom deserves a quiet time. But I have to tell you, our kids are all grown up. There's no one at home. And sometimes I'll come in to tell Jackie something, and she'll say, Oh, I'm having my quiet time. And I'll be, uh, Just a second, I want to tell you something. And, nope, quiet time. So later, I'm in the kitchen doing something, and, and she finally wants to talk to me, and she'll come in and say, hey, I, there's some things I really need to talk to you about work. And I'll say, that's too bad. I'm having a quiet time. <laughs> it's very hard to have the kind of communication that we need when we're deeply discouraged to where we can have a good listener who actually asks questions and allows us to express like everything just seems meaningless. We think there's something really wrong with this. That's why people make such tragic mistakes in their lives. Because they're discouraged, they're not thinking correctly. People make horrible mistakes. And young people, you have the power to make decisions. And you can make some horrible mistakes if you're discouraged. So if you can learn that you need to find someone that listens to you, your life will be transformed. Or if you can listen to other people. When our kids were growing up, since I had a tendency to try to fix everyone's problem quickly, Jackie said, wait for one hour listening to our kids until you can finally um, begin to talk. That was a very hard process because we had our conversations out in the hot tub. Do you know what it's like to be in a hot tub for an hour, how wrinkly your skin is? (laughs) But finally it would be time to talk. So here God has this book of Ecclesiastes. He allows... Solomon, it's a dialogue between Solomon and himself, if that's who wrote the book, um, to start off by just saying everything in the world is meaningless. Nothing even matters. It's so dreary. It's so boring. Everything under the sun is meaningless. And God gives time to hear what's on people's hearts. Because it's one of the greatest ways you can encourage someone is by listening when they are discouraged. And it's like you take the stinger out. You take the poison out whenever that goes on. Eric Fromm, the Jewish psychologist who wrote The Art of Loving, also wrote The Art of Listening. And he makes the same point, which is basic, psychological, healthy, well-researched, is that people need to be listened to. He says the less than 5% of psychologists are actually good at listening. And they need to be better at listening. Well, I can recommend good psychiatrists and psychologists to you to listen to what the problem is. There's something just freeing and liberating to be able to get it off of your heart. And also I can tell you that Pastor David is an incredible listener. Pastor Carol's even a better listener because she has to listen to Pastor David. And um, Pastor Jackie's a great listener. Um, We have lots of wonderful listeners and pastors in the church. And that's what they do is they sit and they listen. And they love you and they care for you. And it makes a huge difference. Yesterday, Jackie was doing one of the things that she does is that there's a lady in our community, been 15 years, a friend of Jackie's who's suffering from schizophrenia, who's separated from her family, gets kicked out of all the tent cities, and she's Jackie's friend. So when her family wants to get in touch with her, they call Jackie and say, could you get this message to our loved one, who everyone else is scared of? And when Jackie goes to her, I ask, Jackie, how was your time yesterday when you went to visit this person and, and met them in a certain place? She said they they talked and they talked and they talked and they talked. Why? Because someone was willing to listen. 
we need to be better at listening. The Educational Leadership Journal, which is for teachers, says that kids who are behind several grade levels, that they may show amazing progress of catching up if they can tell someone their story. It's that simple. Even if it's another group of students. Um, there's a group that the International Listening Society show it says it's one of the most important ingredients in success in school and business. And they said, and yet less than 2% of people have ever been trained to listen. Because there's all kinds of issues that we can do, like paraphrasing and, and questioning and patience and statements of love and empathy that can help us to be better listeners. Secondly, we see from the book of um, Ecclesiastes that a humble perspective in encouraging. It says there's a time for everything, a season for everything, a season for every activity under, the, under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to rebuild. There's a famous song by the, the birds, right? In every season, turn, turn, turn. And um, that's a very poetic passage. But if we have that humility in that sense, then we can be ourselves. It's hard to go through high school. There's a lot of pressure now more than ever with the tests to get into college and all the different things and the loans that, that people have to take and thinking about your job and who you are and your uniqueness. But if you realize it's just a season to get through and you can be surrounded by a loving community, it makes a huge difference. It's hard to be old. My dad, um, he has two canes now. He always has a statement as he said, getting old is not for the young. It makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> but there's something that happens if you can just say and say, there's a seasons of life. I had my knee replaced and it's going really well and the doc, my doctor actually said I could hike from Mexico to Canada if I went to. I could ski. I'm ahead of schedule. But he said there's one thing I can't do is I can't run. He said that constant pounding on, even on a, on a treadmill you can't do. When he said that I just grew so sad because all my life I loved to run. I used to be a runner. I don't, I don't look like it. But I used to be a runner. And I thought I can never run again. And I was just sad. But then being a pastor, I went to visit someone who was in a wheelchair that could never walk again and, and, and couldn't communicate very well. And they had a sense of just the peacefulness of, of things they didn't understand. And God understood. And they were enjoying life in the middle of it. There's a peace that comes and the humility to realize when you're single and you're just desperately wanting to be married and you're single or you're married and you're desperately wanting to be single, both things can happen. There's a peace that comes and just a contentment to say God sees a bigger picture clear throughout the universe. I am who God created me to be. I'm in this situation of life. And that simple humility creates the capacity to be encouraged. So there's an encouragement that comes from humility. There's an encouragement that comes by knowing that God is working even when we're discouraged in ways that we don't even know. Many times the solutions to our problems are going on and we didn't even know it. There was a person from our church that was going to law school at the University of Washington. They graduated. After the sermon, they said, Pastor Tim, you inspired me. I wanted to go into politics. I'm going to run for the Senate. So we met together at my office. We planned his campaign for the Senate. And he tried to go into, he said, I learned to practice law while I'm going into politics. He ran for the Senate here in Washington. And halfway through, he asked me to step aside after I was preaching, and he said, I need to tell you something. He said, what was I thinking? No one knows who I am. There's no way that I can possibly win. I've just made a fool out of myself. I've invested all my money in this. I've, I've taken all my friends' time trying to run for the Senate. I'm going to quit. And I told this friend that I played football with, I said, you know, so many times we quit right before, quit too soon. Finish the election. You've worked so hard. Well, the day after the election, I opened up the Seattle Times, and you know what it said? The biggest um, upset in the state. He had won 
the office to the Senate and went on to have a great career, be the Secretary of Agriculture, all kinds of things, and still involved in politics. But he was that close to quitting too soon. And that's so true for all of us. In other words, from a spiritual perspective, we've realized that when we're in our deepest discouragement, after you failed the test or you have to study, have you ever had to study for a test and, and, you, and you go to your mom and dad, please pray for me, I have a test tomorrow. And your mom and dad say, well, we'll pray for you, but you need to study for that test. In those moments when you feel like you've done all that you can and you want to give up, it's too soon to give up. Because God's working in ways that we can't see right now when you're discouraged. And I can tell you story after story. When David was a lonely single, when Carol was a lonely single, they'd both gone through divorce. They thought there was no one in the world for them. They were both sitting in the same sanctuary, right? At one point, that was true. And here God was working, and you guys didn't know the whole story. None of us knew. Only God knows. And God is working even when we discourage. Can you say that with me one time just so that you know the truth? God is working even when we're discouraged. That's the view from the scriptures and the view from Ecclesiastes. Because it says God has made everything beautiful in its own time. What a great verse. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from the beginning to the end. That's what the Bible says, not what I'm saying. And the last point is to enjoy the little things. It says, so I conclude that first there is nothing better for a man or woman. I added an and woman because that's referring to man in the sense of all humanity. Than to be happy and to enjoy him or herself as long as he or she can. And second, he or she should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of his or her labors. For these are gifts from God. In other words... Enjoy the little things. Here's the basic problem with a lot of Christians who have really shallow faith. When they pray a prayer, they say, I'll believe in you, God, if you organize the whole universe the way I want it. I don't know how many times I'll have a conversation with someone and they'll say, I'll believe in God if I win the lottery. I've never heard of anyone winning the lottery and saying, oh, now I believe in God. No, they're too busy spending the money to ever do that. God doesn't answer prayers that way. What God does as he comes down in some way, if we'll open our eyes, and he shows us that he's with us, that he cares for us, that there's hope, that we can get through it. And that may come in the smile of a child or the friendship of someone who actually sit and listen to you and say, let's go through this together, or the twinkle in the eye of a senior adult, or a prayer that's answered. I prayed, I prayed that prayer this weekend. I was discouraged. And I said, God, send, pick me up in some little way. And here's the weird thing that happened. I went to get a latte. I pulled up, and the lady said, the man ahead of you, which I didn't know, has bought your latte. And the person across the way. See how good it is to say that prayer? You get a free latte every time you say it. <laughs> Nothing changed in my list of problems. It was just like, wait a minute, I just prayed, pick me up, and God bought me a latte through someone. And it can be a card or encouragement, or when you pray, you have a sense of God's closeness. And that's all you need is to know that God's there. That he's not condemning you for having problems and that you're not the only one in the world who's ever been discouraged and, 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 and wrestled with depression and that might need help. No, all humanity does. But what God wants us to know is that he's there with us to help us. We're going to sing the doxology and then I'm going to close this with a word of prayer.